So, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Andy. So, once again, I am Dr. Ayan East Pacquiao, a faculty from the School of Allied Health Sciences of the Pharmacy Department of San Pedro College. And in this afternoon, I will be talking about telepharmacy from a pedagogical standpoint, the methods and techniques for the preparation of future pharmacists to handle extended pharmacy services. So, basically, this talk will cover the following aspects of telehealth and telepharmacy. So first, there will be a brief discussion on telehealth and the role that it plays in the maintenance of health of persons and populations, as well as the pharmacist's role in telehealth. Second, a discussion of telepharmacy and how it is considered as an external, pharm extended rather, pharmacy service, and what are the skills and competencies that should be present in a pharmacist in order to deliver telepharmacy services. Third, a short discussion on the activities that I provide to my students in order to prepare them for telepharmacy practice when they become pharmacists. So when we talk about telehealth, this is the delivery of healthcare from a distance using communication technology that enables the provision of synchronous and asynchronous consultation between patients and clinicians. Telehealth is a very convenient method of healthcare delivery as it offers patients and clinicians multiple benefits such as convenience of time, medical alert, prompts, and more complete data and information utilization. A systematic review and meta-analysis conducted by Snoswell et al. indicated that telehealth provides similar or sometimes better health outcomes for patients in comparison to standard care, which involves patient visits to clinicians and healthcare providers. This is also supported by a review by Matha et al. on the benefits associated with the use of telehealth. As you can see here on our screen, we have a lot of benefits and challenges associated with the use and with the partaking of telehealth. Again, telehealth interventions were able to lower all-cause mortality, lower heart failure admission rates, and shorter length of stay in hospitals by patients. Their study attributed that cost effectiveness, access and timeliness of care, emergency preparedness, and provider patient mismatch reduction led to a success in telehealth practice. As you can see here from our slide, there are a lot of benefits that are involved when we practice telehealth. There is the decreased travel time and cost and then avoiding unnecessary emergency room visits because we can contact our clinicians and our healthcare providers at the push of a button. There's also improved access. There's also telemonitoring. That's also an aspect in telepharmacy that we're going to talk a little bit about later. There's also improved emergency preparedness and there is the decreased supply-demand mismatch where the patients are able to approach the appropriate clinician for information with regards to their diseases or conditions. There are a few challenges associated with our telehealth. There is overutilization, widening disparities, and there is also the context of patient data security, especially in countries where patient data security is not yet well established. So some countries like in the United States of America have instituted telehealth before the pandemic. This is an important, this is an important aspect that we're going to be circling around in the entirety of the talk because telehealth, telepharmacy, as well as other teleservices improved or were given light during the pandemic because, because of lack of access, a lot of people meant or went to telehealth services in order to avail of important services. Overall, telehealth has demonstrated its viability as an adjunct to healthcare practice in the COVID-19 pandemic, where patients 
had limited access to healthcare professions due to lockdowns, movement restrictions, and social distancing. Telehealth technologies were maximized during the pandemic through on-demand telehealth, a process which allows patients to be screened and care provided by the clinicians is patient-centered and conducive to self-quarantine. This protects patients, clinicians, and the community from exposure. Besides this, other aspects of telehealth practice were highlighted. Telehealth utilization has stabilized at levels 38 times higher than before the pandemic. The infographic also indicates that 57% of providers view telehealth more favorably than before COVID-19 and 64% are more comfortable using it. After all, there is the ease of access. At any point in time, you can just go and to your clinician and ask. You can either do video conferencing, you can either place a phone call or send an email or send a text message. So telehealth uptake also varies by specialty with the highest penetration in psychiatry. So this is, um, there are a lot of areas of telehealth where it's underutilized and there are some areas of practice that are very, very um, appropriate or telehealth blooms in a sense. In that case, Telehealth is something that we expect to stay because of the fact that COVID-19 has sparked the need for telehealth. Telehealth enables patients to receive care from home, increasing the speed, convenience, and access. A lot of providers say their organization has increased their use of telehealth during COVID-19 or because of COVID-19. New technologies were also invested in order to gain more uh, business aspect of the telehealth practice. And a lot of patients are more increasing or they have more access to healthcare professionals because of telehealth. And one of these aspects that we talk about in terms of telehealth is, of course, telepharmacy. So when we talk about telepharmacy, telepharmacy is a form of pharmaceutical care in which pa pharmacists and patients can interact using information and communication technology facilities. Multiple studies and reviews have discussed that the peak practice of telepharmacy can be observed during the pandemic for the same reasons that telehealth was adopted. The disruption of access to community pharmacists brought about by the pandemic led to the adoption of telepharmacy services and discovering digital ways and means to relay important medication information to patients. During my practice in the pandemic, a lot of people were more prone to messaging me via social media platforms, asking for medication recommendations, asking for possible ways and means to safeguard their health during the COVID-19. What do we do in order for us to limit exposure, and to limit the chances of getting the disease. So in this case, what are the activities involved in telepharmacy services? Now, as you can see on this slide, current uses of telepharmacy involves counseling by either telephone, the medication management, collaborative drug management, central processing and remote order entry, remote supervision of technical dispensing, automated dispensing system, and, of course, medication kiosks. However, in the Philippine setting, because there are limitations with the amount of data that we handle, so we are currently limited to the context of medication deliveries through specific careers, patient counseling by telephone, or live video conferencing. There is also medication therapy management, and drug information relay service to patients. In the United States, there is a uni unified healthcare system. Therefore, clinicians as well as pharmacists have access to patient health and medical records. However, in countries that the context of medical records is not accessible directly by healthcare professionals, 
the process of teleservices is somewhat limited. Telepharmacy has increased functionality as patient medical records can be seen via use of smartphones and gadgets in first world countries. But here in the Philippine setting, again, it is limited because of lack of access to patient medical histories. Pharmacists that perform telepharmacy services need to rely on their communication skills as well as their ability to gather information from their patients in order to give the most appropriate care available. Now, how are pharmacists faring in this pandemic period in terms of counseling and other extended pharmacy services? Studies with regards to perceptions, attitudes, and competence of pharmacists and telepharmacy-related services tell us that generally, pharmacists have a positive attitude towards this practice. The use of digital technologies, however, were a challenge for older generations of pharmacists. But there was still a surmountable problem. The pandemic led older pharmacists to understand that we need to use technologies at our disposal in order to provide care to our patients. From, the bis from a business model side, although pharmacies never really closed here in the Philippines during the pandemic, there was still a problem with lowered sales. And because of lowered sales, pharmacists um, look towards other avenues and they started advertising through social media. They started reaching out to their patients because the pharmacy practice here in the Philippines pre-pandemic was very transactional in nature where patients would go to their pharmacy, they would buy their medications, and then pharmacists would sell. It was very transactional. Uh, counseling was an option that is done usually, usually during off-peak hours. But during peak hours where a lot of patients would gather and buy their essential medications, pharmacists did not have time nor could afford to provide counseling because the business aspect is rolling. When we talk about uh, what would be key competencies that help pharmacists to adapt to what is currently happening with regards to telepharmacy, a lot of the key competencies were their willingness to adopt to new technologies. Older generations had a hard time adopting, but it can be seen that even in studies or even in community settings, a lot of older generation of pharmacists would still try to adopt these new technologies, the use of social media platforms, the use of messaging apps like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Viber. These technologies were then uh, pharmacists in pharmacists tended to try to gravitate here because they wanted to try to increase their sales and profits even during the pandemic. So with that in mind, besides the willingness to adopt new technologies, communication skills are still important and of course a working internet connection. This is one of the challenges of telehealth and telepharmacy also. Because a bad connection reduces the capacity for good communication. And of course, a therapeutic relationship. Without establishing a proper therapeutic relationship with your patient, the patient will not choose to avail of the services because they, have, they do not trust the pharmacist. So these are the key competencies that pharmacists needed in order to uh, market telehealth in itself. As a professor aiming to prepare future pharmacists for this type of practice, along with minimum competencies required, the curriculum for pharmacy informatics in our school was modified to accommodate telepharmacy practice because we saw pre-pandemic, we, we were just talking about the different technologies, what we usually do, or what, you, what the students will be exposed to when they start working in the pharmacy setting. However, the 
pandemic has changed how we are go how we go about with normal pharmacy operations there is the inclusion of telehealth and telemonitoring so with that we created or rather i created special areas within our curriculum that would tackle the aspect of telepharmacy so we included assessment of clinical data and literature we also included development of protocols and guidelines for answering medically in well, inclined questions through digital communication media, as well as addressing potential barriers for specific patient groups. We have a lot of patient groups that have trouble use, utilizing telepharmacy services. We have elderly patients, illiterate patients, patients that choose not to use telehealth services. So we would we want to introduce these kinds of practices to our patients so that they can understand or they can see that there are far easier methods for access of information. So these, the outputs that we were able to gather for this were presented in a panel presentations for applicability and acceptability for our patients. So we tried this, we tried this these protocols in public and then afterwards after testing um, we gave feedback to our students with their development na, this is somewhat uh, this is somewhat impractical we need to change these portions so we gave we gave out uh, changes for our learning activities so the department also made use of objectively structured clinical evaluations for our students for digital media in order to ascertain their level of skill in engaging patients with drug therapy problems. As you can see here in our slide, this is one of our questions for our Objectively Structured Clinical Examination or Evaluation or our OSCE. So the student is to give an assessment about pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapy. And then there is also prescription reading because there are some prescriptions that when sent are blurred. So there are times that the student needs to focus and to identify what type of drug is this. In that case, also have another here, another prescription where students are tasked to read and to identify and to ask questions with regards to the therapy. So the development of drug patient friend, uh, drug uh, Patient-friendly drug information packets. We also create infographics and also videos for our social media platforms to discuss drug information for the general public. We also we are also currently in the process of developing medical literacy, literacy assessment tools in order to further identify gaps in the in our patients' knowledge base. And then we can work from there. And then we try to inculcate it with our telepharmacy practice. So with that, uh, my presentation is done. And I hope that you managed to get some important points for telepharmacy and the measures that we do in order to prepare our future pharmacists towards this practice. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jan. Apologize if you hear noise in my sound, in my voice, because it's raining, pouring rain here, very, very rainy. So uh, after uh, Dr. Ian, we will have a doc, Professor Dr. Erwin martinez Fallet. Dr. Erwin, are you with us? Yes, uh, Professor Andy, I'm here. So yeah, good afternoon, Dr. Erwin. Yes, good afternoon. I'm so excited to actually meet your students and also your faculty. Yes. Yes. So uh, I would like to introduce a bit about uh, Dr. Erwin Faller or Professor Erwin Faller. He is a professor in pharmacy practice. Yeah. So he is also the director for international linkages and also the coordinator for COIL program as well in the San Pedro College, Philippines. Dr. Erwin. So, uh, at this moment, we are not only have the students, not only the faculty staff, but also uh, public participants because we openly offer this uh, 
course to uh, public. So the practitioners are coming into this uh, college, uh, into this course as well. And also some our college from abroad. We have uh, some participant from Singapore and also from Pakistan. And I see some ones from India as well. So it's a quite a broad uh, participants here. And we look forward to your uh, lecture, Dr. Amin. Please, the stage is yours. Or the screen is yours, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sir Andy. And to the, to the administrators and also to the staff and students of uh, University of Erlanga and also to my co-lecturer, uh, Dr. Ayan Papiel, and also to our beloved uh, beloved um, audience um, for this afternoon. It's quite a rainy here. I'm actually in Manila right now, and uh, it's quite very rainy, also similar also in um, Indonesia. Now, I would like to share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. So... Okay, it's quite very exciting um, afternoon that we have because I think uh, there's a lot of things uh, already being presented by uh, Dr. Ayan Pacquiao. And I think with, uh, with um, tele telepharmacy or uh, we have actually our telehealth you know, that was presented and also in cooperation then you know, what he was uh, presenting of the experiences that he has in educating our students. Uh, because I think he was uh, teaching with pharmacoinformatics. And uh, yeah, that was really, really very exciting you know, to incorporate telepharmacy um, into the curriculum itself. No? And we, have, we are actually integrating also with uh, uh, BPOs, no? call centers, no? to be a training hub here in San Pedro with regards to tele, uh, telepharmacy. And um, uh, as part of my involvement, uh, with the telepharmacy, I am actually the pharmacist consultant of RACES uh, tele, uh, telepharmacy or telehealth or tele teleconsultation uh, with regards to the smoking cessation program and also the some of the medication counseling and also medication review now, that is uh, based in uh, Malaysia. Now, um, my topic is all about improving medication adherence through telepharmacy in the Philippines. So uh, with this, I'm going to give a little bit of background in the Philippine context about telehealth, telemedicine, and going forward to telepharmacy, and what would be the impact then to our study with regards to the medication adherence, and what is then the impact to the patient you know, with regards to our study. And in relation to that also, uh, with regards to COVID-19, where it started, and of course, beyond. I would like to acknowledge first the organizers of this um, prestigious uh, event with University of Erlanga. This is a very good um, interaction then uh, with your students, the faculty. And I think we are live via YouTube and also Facebook and also other social media. And also to uh, your administrators, the dean and the vice dean, and also uh, to my uh, university, San Pedro College, for allowing us to be here, to be with you in this afternoon of this exciting topic. Now, uh, I would like to give some a little bit background where we are with Dr. Uh, Ayan Papia. We are from the southern part in the Philippines called Mindanao, one of the biggest island also in the Philippines. And also we are in the southern part Really, the southern part, they, they call it as Davao City, one of the beautiful places no, in the Philippines. And of course, uh, I we are actually located in Davao City. Uh, we have two campuses, the Ulas campus and the main campus. So you can see the picture. I hope it is clear with you uh, that if you go to the heart of the city, we are there in San Pedro College. And we have two campuses also um, just 30 minutes away from the city. We have the Ulas campus, our basic education. And it is where our, uh, we call it the animal laboratory and uh, laboratories. And of course, research uh, hub. We're in our high, uh, 
high tech equipments are there for uh, for natural product development and also animal uh, study. Now uh, I know that some of you perhaps are also um, you know kind of already get out you know, from this kind of COVID-19 hysteria that we have and moving forward uh, to your you know to your exciting moment to have face to face with your co-students and also to your faculty, uh, especially first year students who haven't yet tried to have a face to face. At the time in 2020, 2020 uh, I, th I think I'm, until now, we are already uh, gearing towards face-to-face. Uh, -to -face, no? And um, of course, these are my discussion points. Uh, the, from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, what is then the effect you know, to the economy? And how do uh, telehealth and telepharmacy emerge because of the downtrend of the economy? And of course, the COVID-19 updates. Then in the Philippines, um, and of course, getting towards then uh, now, I think with the COVID-19, is getting to have a lot of variants. No? But then nevertheless, people are traveling from one place to another like me. I'm already in Manila. <laughs> and of course, the regulation from the FDA about telemedicine and telepharmacy, according to RA10918, our pharmacy law, and of course, the guidelines to clinicians and how do telemedicine works. And uh, I think there are some academicians or in the in the different universities that adopted with telepharmacy as one of their to reach out you know, to the people. Okay. And of course, what are our initiatives and also beyond? As we all know that uh, telepharmacy is a very unique and very innovative way on how we be able to deliver our pharmacy services, no? uh, whether uh, whether it is a delivery um, in terms of goods or a delivery in terms of our services. No? Uh, we cannot deny the fact that, yes, uh, we can say that uh, still face-to-face -face is a good and a better way in terms of communicating our patient, but we cannot deny the fact that uh, communication through uh, through Messenger, through Zoom, no, to other platform is also one way you know, how we'll be able to make it accessible to all in terms of access to healthcare, especially during the time of pandemic. No? And I think it's still we'll be able to adapt no? in this time of the post-pandemic. We still actually adopted telepharmacy in all manners, whether it's a delivery of goods and of course of uh, services. And we all, yes, all of us no, as pharmacists and a pharmacy student, we be able to become part and parcel of our role to manage in terms of the diseases. And we are then committed no, in terms of delivering uh, pharmaceutical care no, and eradication of any of the drug-related problems that we have. So that is why we always undergo counseling. We always undergo drug tracking and examination, even also monitoring uh, for blood glucose, uh, blood uh, blood pressure monitoring and all no, in our own uh, pharmacy. No? So this can also be done in monitoring themselves, no, their patient no, in their houses also. Okay. So then um, it started actually uh, telepharmacy way back then, long, long time ago, but then it was really accepted during the time of COVID-19. Why? Because people are already at their houses or their home. And of course, uh, you know, they may have difficulty to have the access um, in terms of their pharmacy. You now, in terms of their health, uh, they may have a problem. That is why they, uh, they we actually adapted uh, teleconsultation, telehealth, telepharmacy, that deliver actually goods and services at the at the forefront you know, of their houses via uh, via different um, platforms that we have. You no, know? it can be a social media platform. It can also be Zoom platform or any platform in that manner at that time. You no, know? or even actually sending e-prescriptions you no know, to the pharmacy also. You no. Know? Uh, with that. So because of the growing trend of the pandemic at that time, there was growing. It's not only 
15,000. That was a time in uh, 2020, no? and it was growing millions already no, died because of that in the Philippines. Um, so it, re it was realized that we can really have an access of consultation to medical doctors via online plot format, via Google uh, format, or even Zoom format at that time. Even also, um, there are growing trends in the hospital setting. Even receiving actually care at that time was very, very, very unaccept, uh, unaccept, uh, accessible at the time. No? Even uh, that is why there might be a lot of confirmed cases. But not only COVID-19 that was skyrocketing at that time or increasing at that time, but also in terms of hypertension, diabetes, lifestyle disease, because they are only at their houses, meaning that they may have physical inactivity at that time, right? So some of you getting chubbier, not getting to be uh, more, no more fatter at that time, no, because of the uh, you are just staying at your houses. No? So even in our local hospital, there are more than four hundred plus active cases per day because of uh, during the twenty twenty at that time, and that is why. Um, doctors really actually reach out you know, to people, especially on public health advisories um, in terms of uh, consultation for lifestyle diseases you know, and etc. Because as we all know, COVID plus comorbidity will be equal will be equivalent then to death, right? So if you have COVID plus hypertension, diabetes and also other comorbidity, that will be one plus one equals to two, right? So it will have this kind of effect. Even in the pharmacy, there are a lot of queuing up, no? and uh, uh, it's quite very busy at that time. And that is why even also pharmacy adapted because there are great demand in terms of supply with a medication. And uh, at that time also, there are lacking even also with paracetamol, or even also the normal fever, no, for uh, meaning medications like paracetamol are have uh, already been, you know, kind of uh, a lot of fake news that there was a uh, there was a lacking in terms of paracetamol in the Philippines already at the time. So meaning that uh, pharmacy also adapted to have uh, other services like, for example, tele tele pharmacy. But it's already been out in our law, the RA1091, Republic Act 10918, that it has already been, you know, the word telepharmacy has already been there. Online pharmacy has already been there. And that is why we easily adapted to this kind of platform you know, uh, ready for the pandemic. You know? So there was actually um, a circular order, a memoranda, by the Food and Drug Administration in the Philippines, FDA Philippines, in the guidelines on the use of electronic means of prescription for drugs for the benefit of individual vulnerable to COVID-19, especially those who have problems related to hypertension, diabetes, and etc. that may have like geriatric patients, older people that may have problems regarding accessibility. So, uh, the doctor will just send the e-prescription to them and then maybe perhaps someone from the family member can actually get you know, the medication because of the e-prescription that they'll be able to present in the pharmacy. So that is the FDA circular order at that time, number 007, series of 2020. One of the guidelines then of the use of electronic means of prescription at that time was actually with the use of electronic prescription that you need just need to present it to the pharmacy uh, with an authorization if it is not yours uh, or if that will be your mom or your dad or a geriatric uh, part of the family then, then of course the, you need to present uh, a kind of letter of authorization uh, from your part. And uh, one of the requirements, if that to be for a senior citizen, uh, you need to present also, also your senior citizen card. No? And you need to have your authorization for a particular discount no, in the pharmacy. So um, you need to actually show it 
the some of the uh, in the prescription a digital signature and all those um, information with regards to the uh, a legal prescription there. Okay, so in terms of dispensing of medicine, you just need to present it. It must be valid. It must be uh, it must be valid. It must be on the date. Okay, and of course it must be issued by a licensed practitioner. No. Uh, like, for example, if you're given with antibiotic or anti-infective or antiviral preparation, you, you just need to be given with one week after it's issue one. So you cannot actually uh, you know, get medication after one week you know, after you've been prescribed with antibiotics and all. You know? So that is the particular regulation by our Food and Drug Administration in the Philippines. And if you are going to acquire with a discount for senior citizen or person with disability or person with uh, physical challenges, you need to be able to show a letter of authorization. If you are not the one who will be able to get that medication, it's coming from you, uh, a family member who is a geriatric patient. And you need to show your senior citizen card to have a discount. Okay. For there was a guideline actually for Filipino clinicians, but then there is no guideline relating for pharmacists. So pharmacists actually relate it on what are then uh, that has been done by the by the prescriber. You now with this guideline on teleconsultation, according to the guideline, this is for Filipino physician intended uh, in terms of teleconsultation in lieu with the outpatient or face-to-face -face encounter that they have during the COVID-19 pandemic, okay? So these are the modalities during the time wherein they can have video, audio, can be, no? text message, can also be, no? the, and of course, it can be synchronous or asynchronous, okay? That was in 2020 that they have adopted this kind of guideline, no? wherein they allow the documents to be sent to them, and then they be able to interpret and they be able to send you know, in terms of a prescription and all. Okay. Knowing with that, especially with emergency cases you know, during the time of COVID-19. Okay. And of course, they be able to have a follow-up through, you know, whether it is synchronous or asynchronous, or they need to visit. If that will be like a, a very severe condition, they need to visit in terms in the hospital setting or in the clinic, okay? So in the virtual physical examination by the physician, they need to be able to look into consideration. So it's a little bit of challenge for doctors to actually view in terms of their uh, physical examination. As we all know, uh, in the clinical setting or even as a clinical uh, pharmacist, they be able to really look into all the consideration for physical examination. But the question is, how would they be able to have it in a virtual format? No? Because uh, like, for example, blood pressure, if your patient may not have like a blood pressure monitoring, so how? No? So that would be a major challenge. So they need to go to the nearest uh, barangay or village uh, health clinic to have this kind of uh, monitoring and all. And that is why we'll be able to advise the client or the patient to really monitor there's a notebook that you'll be able to monitor for morning, evening time that there must be a monitoring and all. So these are the things that uh, they'll be able to do as part of their guideline. And um, according to some specialty in terms of telemedicine, uh, they'll be able to look into some consideration of what type of patient that they have, what kind of strategy that they'll be able to have in terms of technology and what to be the outcome at that time. Okay, especially on different specialty like cardiology, which look into heart rate, no blood pressure monitoring, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that they be able to have early diagnosis. So at the time, we only focus into um, those like COVID nineteen related, but we don't know already what is going on with dengue, what is going on with uh, you know there are a lot of geriatric patients that may have unacceptable no in accessibility in terms of their uh, their cardiovascular drugs or for diabetes and all no so 
this our major problem because even our health health center, the local uh, government health center are closed at the time. No? So there might be inaccessibility in terms of the, the health care at the time. Now, in terms of appointment, they may actually have face-to-face, -face, that is, uh, especially emergency cases, or it can be in a video call. Now, if that is not that very urgent, you, uh, now you need to really set an appointment to medical doctor, any healthcare provider before you will be able. And it takes time, you know, it takes time for them to really manage to set an appointment with a specialist or consultants. No? Um, it's quite very difficult. Now, like my father was actually um, setting for an appointment, it really takes time no, for him to set an appointment no? uh, before the doctor actually called us and have a teleconsultation and all. But it's still very helpful no, because uh, some of the clinics are closed at the time. So it's quite very, very helpful. No? And of course, uh, appointments no, to be given to the, the, uh, to the doctors. So in terms of high quality teleconsultation, there are steps that you need to follow, like conveying on uh, value with your, uh, with your welcome, introducing the technology if that would be the first time, because not all of uh, our client, our patient are well oriented with the technology. So you need to be able to orient them and talk to them that this is also similar in terms of the face-to-face and so because they may have difficulty in terms of expressing or maybe the signal because of the internet connection. There are a lot of challenges, no? but you need to be able to bear with it. No? Um, it takes time you know, for you to learn and for your patient to grasp you know, the essence of the technology. And you'll be able to collaboratively set what would be your agenda because of the time limit and, of course, the internet connection. There's a lot of barriers, especially the noise background and all, no? And um, what would be the empathy that you'll be able to have because this is a virtual, you cannot touch the patient. You cannot even talk uh, and eye to eye to them. What would be your empathy that you'll be able to express, whether it is nonverbal or verbal? Some of the doctors may have difficulty. Do you know that uh, according to some of the study, they may also have difficulty in terms of using with the technology they may actually hide their face. They may have, they don't have a concrete background. They may have a lot of noise background and all that may have difficulty to really express in terms of empathy because of a lot of barriers no? in terms of that time. No? And of course, reflective listening will be able to summarize, you'll be able to clarify information and of course, teach back or repeat back of their understanding or what would be the medication is yes, there are a lot of things and you need to have provide in terms of closure and what would be the next appointment to be done and how to actually reach you, you know, in terms of the possible appointment via Zoom or via phone call or whatsoever. No? So there must be really a certain uh, quality of the work. And how does tele telemedicine actually work? You no, know, by setting an appointment and, of course, referring it to the medical providers and all. No? And uh, you'll be able to really look into consideration also with, uh, I think there's someone actually talking also in the background. <laughs> uh, this is not some, some kind of a difficulty also later on. If you do actually telepharmacy and all. Okay, uh, I'll, okay thank you very much. So, um you'll be able to have a referral and, of course, the central, the national telemedicine system will be able to locate a particular doctor, in whether it's a regional or in the public or in the government hospital or whatsoever. They'll be able to uh, connect you with a specialist or the medical practitioners no, at the time. That was a study conducted also by the National Telemedicine System no, and University of the Philippines, Manila. Now, the flow that they have before consultation, there are a lot of preparations that you'll be able to have, no? even also like um, in terms of privacy and confidentiality, they need to be able to, and of course, looking at the internet connection, the signal that will look into appropriateness of what kind of modality that you'll be able to look, to, to actually use. No? Like, for example, if your patient is in the rural area, 
of course, there might be problems in terms of internet. So what are you going to have modality so that you can be able to have it via call or via uh, SMS? No? That would be a short message to them. No? And of course, during consultation, you need to be able to have concrete agenda with your patient and you'll be able to conduct history taking or even virtual physical examination. Similar also with pharmacy that you'll be able to have history taking and all. No? And of course, after consultation, you'll be able to have a summary. And of course, completeness of the data is very important. And explain to them that the e-prescription that they need to be able to present it in the pharmacy during that time, or the doctor be able to send it to the pharmacy and the, the, the patient will be able to get it into the, uh, into the pharmacy already. No? So it depends upon no? um, in terms of the workflow that they have with the physician and also with the pharmacist and also with the... So this is the example then of a consent form during teleconsultation, uh, what to be explaining the benefit and the potential risk no? using telemedicine consultation. Okay, And even the co consent from a doctor to record this teleconsultation, okay? And even also having uh, sample documentation like history taking and uh, the potential drugs that they've been taking, allergies, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the feedback then in evaluation during that time, okay? And of course, we have also uh, conducted a study uh, also regarding the perception of um of the people, the public, no, with regards to the reliability, financial cost, efficiency, then, and interaction and ease of use and usefulness of telemedicine. And we have found out in the study that, yes, there, there was really a high level of uh, perception of patient with regards to uh, efficiency, financial cost, reliability, interaction, and all, no? Because it really saved their time no? while they be going to the hospital or to the clinic is saved in terms of their money. They will focus only on into paying with the, uh, with the professional fee, with the doctors. And of course, um, the time spent no? of really searching and getting the application no? is very, very short for them, no? Also, so these are the advantages that they have got and the level of perception that they have, uh, you no, know, in comparison then to the face to face. So it, for them, it's quite easy to use with the telemedicine and the services that they provided with the telemedicine was also uh, good, you no, know, in terms of the services that provided by the medical doctors and of course the healthcare professional. According to the study, there is really a significant relationship then in terms of perception and the demographic profile in terms of all levels of variables, whether it is efficacy and location, financial cost, location, reliability and age, and of course, the usefulness, particularly those who are staying in a very far flung area, they can even have a great access in terms of telemedicine because of the you know, um, it's only virtual that they'll be able to have. No? And um, yeah, it's um, the telemedicine is actually also widespread in the Philippines, even in the clinic, no? private clinics and public clinics, and even also in the hospitals is already been adopted no? in the Philippine setting. Now, um, in, even also uh, by the National Telehealth Service Program, they already been adopted and they conducted a study with regards to the telemedicine, how do people actually maximize information technology so that they be able to deliver for the healthcare for the people? And it was found out in the different areas in the Philippines, as per the study of the telehealth uh, services program by the government and in, in coordination with the University of the Philippines, um, it was uh, found out that these are the case referral that was uh, that was actually being maximized by the people more on internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, no, obigyni, no. So it's very pitiful, no. Those who will be pregnant at the time during the time of COVID, no? because there might be inaccessibility in terms of health at that time, and of course uh, a lot more, no, uh, programs that they be able to to have. 
And of course, um, these are the laws that currently we have in the Philippines to strengthen all about Telehealth Act in the Philippines that was promulgated by the Philippine Congress during June 2012. Okay, so with that also, um, in different universities like the University of the Philippines, they conducted actually the telepharmacy services wherein they have um, their numbers, email address, everything, no? all the information has been there. And uh, the patient will be able to contact no, the pharmacist and the pharmacist will be able to feedback regarding usually with the medications with regards to, you know, uh, a lot of uh, questions regarding their medications and etc. Okay. And of course, uh, in the in Mindanao, uh, we have the, one of the university, the Broken Shark College, also adopted drug information services you know, via Facebook Messenger, via email, or even a blog type, you know, wherein they be able to have accessibility to the people with regards to the services. Even also with emails and other social platforms that they be able to be accessible. Uh, one of the uh, platform that they have is using with a Zoom, uh, with the uh, Google form, no, and etc. as point of the type of inquiry that they have. And uh, once the particular patient will be able to have this inquiry, immediately they'll be able to have their feedback you know, within 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 p.m. So if you are texting or having a message 6 p.m., you'll be able to receive your in the, the inquiries that you have, they'll be able to answer at 8 a.m. the next day also. No? So these are the things that they'll be able to have, the process flow that they have. No? And even also with the hotline from the government, from the Department of Health, is also available. There's a lot actually. Even also with the young pharmacist group in the Philippines, they'll be able also to be available. Uh, one of the study that we have conducted is all about collaborative telemedicine, wherein it's not only with the medical doctors, but this is in cooperation with telepharmacy and telemedicine, wherein both of these healthcare providers will be able to work together in terms of the their disease, uh, their follow-up, you know, their medication adherence, and monitoring you know, and counseling to them. So what we did is that we collaborate with one of the local uh, medical doctor uh, and then connect them with the pharmacy and they'll be working together in terms of their patients. So like, for example, the doctor has a patient, a diabetic patient or hypertensive patient, they connect it with the pharmacy and the pharmacist will be able to monitor in terms of medication adherence, uh, what to be some of the inquiries of the patient and all, no? connecting them in terms of the improvement of their adherence, uh, management of for diabetes, and of course, improving in terms of their laboratory result. And we have found out uh, with our quasi-experimental research design that we have uh, out of, I think this is uh, more than 20 or 30 patients that we have with different social demographic profile between treatment and control group that we have Mostly are actually geriatric patients. And these are actually patients coming from rural health communities in one of the province here in the Philippines. We have found out that uh, during the pre and post test for HbA1c, there was um, there was actually a, a kind of a lowering down no, in terms of their blood glucose, according to our study. Even also the systolic and diastolic are also getting to be improved no, at that time uh, due to the intervention of the medical doctor and also the pharmacist, pharmacist collaboratively together no, in terms of the disease. Now, we have also found out that they have uh, a lot of comorbidities, no, hypertension, tuberculosis, fatty liver, etc. No, and most of them uh, in the treatment group are hypertensive patients. No? So hypertension with diabetes no? as part of their comorbidity. Uh, these are the medications that they use. They have uh, anti-oral uh, hypoglycemic agents. They have also, um, no, there's a lot actually that they are taking. No? And um, the question here is that what to be their medication adherence? And we have found out in the pre 
test that they have really um, a very, very low in terms of their medication adherence. But once they already go into after uh, this collaborative telemedicine intervention that we have, there was a significant, no, uh, significant differences then at the time, no, after the after the after the this kind of treatment or intervention that uh, that we have, no. So the medication the medication adherence actually getting better and better during the time no? of the intervention, and of course uh, we have found out also significantly. Uh, the difference between patient undergoing telemedicine and patient not undergoing telemedicine during our quasi-experimental research design, that there really a significant difference in terms of the medication adherence. Okay. Now, uh, we have also conducted in terms of another province, another area, in terms of the hypertension for patients. These are some of the details from participant number one until the last participant that we have before and after the intervention. So you can see they, uh, according to the guideline of American guidelines that uh, they have a quite high in terms of their, so some of them are in the pre and some of them they already stage one, stage two you know, in terms of their hypertension already. Okay. And uh, that, that was also after um, their intervention. So we have found out uh, during the MyMath, this is a Malaysian medication adherence uh, tool that we have that we have adopted because in the Philippines we don't have still um, uh, a kind of medication adherence tool that will be able to use by the government and also by the private. So we are using actually MyMath, no? uh, which are quite very similar in terms of cultural and of course dynamic you know, dynamism then. Um, of the culture in Malaysia and also in the Philippines. We have also validated it uh, during that time and we have found out that uh, during the time before intervention, they are quite low in terms of the uh, this kind of MIMAT, the medication, medication adherence that they have. After one month of intervention, there was a high um, medication adherences that they have, okay? And of course, et cetera, et cetera, and all. So I'll be able to jump over what are some of our uh, initiatives during the time of COVID-19. We conducted actually a free, a national free online consultation, uh, and we have served almost 1,500 of patients during that time. And we mobilized in cooperation with the uh, Asian Association of Medical Doctors in Asia, or AMDA, at that time. And we have found out that uh, we have a lot of, uh, no, um, uh, we have catered a lot of services, not only uh, free medical um, medical um, checkup that we have or medical consultations that we have, but also in terms of medication review, uh, patient consultation regarding their medication, uh, psycho, psycho, psychological first aid that has been conducted by our social worker and psychologists at that time. And these are, the things that we have found out no, during that time. No? And uh, yeah, we we also donated some of the food to our frontliner during that. These are some of the volunteers uh, at that time, medical students, medical doctors, uh, psychologists, social worker, pharmacists has also been included at the time no, uh, of our intervention. So this is the process of a very simple process. We have actually a triage using our Google form. Uh, we have scheduled then, uh, we are the one pharmacist will be able to schedule and we have talked with the medical doctors with regards to their medication, what have they taken, etc., etc., before they be able to have a referral and consultation with the medical doctors. So we, don't, we do. So this actually national free online consultation that we have is led by the pharmacist. Okay, uh, led by the pharmacist. Easy for us. Uh, to interact with the medical doctors and all during that time, no, and uh, we have we actually consulted throughout the Philippines from Luzon, Visayas, and also Mindanao in terms of referral, medical consultation, medical first uh, psychological first aid, even medication review. And there's uh, a lot of appreciation by our patient at the time and thanking us now with the services that we have provided now for the. Uh, 
for our patient at that time. Okay, and we have uh, we have most of our patients are related to obigyny, hypertension, even also acute um, tonsillitis. These are things, no, uh, that may associate them to COVID nineteen, no, and something like that, like asthma or even respiratory diseases. And most of them are actually um, having no having more consultation to us, even also psychological first aid. One of the pharmacists here and our medical doctor and also uh, our social worker at the time giving free online consultation no, to our uh, to our clients, to our patient also at that time. So these are volunteer doctors and allied health professional uh, that conducted during the time of COVID-19. Okay, a free consultation that we have conducted uh, during the time of COVID-19. Even some appreciations no, from our Patient, you know. I think that's all from my part. These are my references. And thank you very much for inviting me and us you now with Dr. Ian with this uh with this lecture you know, for your student and also uh for our listener and audience for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Darwin. Very, very inspiring talk and also interesting experience, particularly during the uh, disaster management services, I think, yeah. So it's really, really touchful and also really, really uh, give an insight, particularly for me personally, and also we would expect the same thing to the audience. So we invite questions from the audience and then we currently have one questions from Anisha Ahmad to Dr. Erwin, which is preferred by patient consultation via telemedicine, uh, which is preferred by patient consultation via telemedicine with the doctor or telepharmaceuticals with the pharmacist? Who is preferable? Uh, when, when, yes, when, thank you very when, much for the, for the question, Anisha. Um, I think that is a very interesting question. Actually, it depends upon what, uh, what they want you know, in terms of the consultation because um, if they want to have some uh, related to medicine, then of course they'll be able to have pharmacists you know, talking with them you know, with regards to their medication. Sometimes they call, the message, no, and of course, some of them they have e prescriptions not to buy with medications, and of course, the pharmacists be able to have their consultation and all. No, uh, I think that was an experience also by Dr. Is. I think uh, he will be able to add up with you um, his experience. But uh, based upon my experience during that time, um, the one that actually talked with the patient as pharmacist first. No? Because we know how to jot down all of those <laughs> informations now with regards to patient history, what are their medication taken and all. We are the frontliner at, during that time, during our national free online consultation. And we set a referral to the medical doctor. And after the referral to the medical doctor and giving advice by the doctor regarding their disease and given with the medication, we, the pharmacists, actually follow up that's why we have medication counseling and medication review during that time also. Uh, so they really, the patient really love it and they really appreciate it. I think uh, you can see a lot of uh, messages from the patient you know, with regards to their appreciation to the pharmacist, to the medical doctors and all. I, I think I will give the floor to Dr. Ayan with regards to his experience. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Irwin. With regard, with regards to my experience when during, especially during the pandemic, when we were doing uh, consultations, the pharmacy is not necessarily just the the entry point, or they do not necessarily the patients do not necessarily go directly to doctors. They actually go to us first, and then they ask, "Where would you refer us to get?" our to get this type of information so uh, i have experiences before where um patients that there are a lot of elderly patients uh, as our as our customers before for teleservices so these patients would show us their burns bed sores uh they have problems i uh, they have skin conditions and problems Usually, our task there is we refer them to an appropriate doctor. Uh, there is something that we call there is something that we call social prescribing. There's there's also that besides besides the medical needs of our patients, there are also some patients that 
that have welfare issues, they have mental issues, they have problems relating to people. So we also do social prescribing. Besides medical connect, uh, besides connecting our patients to the appropriate doctor or to the necessary medications that they need and the counseling, we also connect them to other entities, other groups. We connect them to groups of people, especially with regards to mental health. So There are people that have problems that I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling lonely, I cannot I cannot talk to the people. I do not have people to talk to inside my house because I'm alone, I'm isolated. So we also provide social prescribing. We we connect them to groups of people who share the same issues and problems. So the pharmas the pharma my my experience for telepharmacy is not necessarily limited to just medication counseling. We also counsel and we connect people to other specialties in order for them to achieve total health and holistic health and wellness. Terrific. That's very interesting answers. And I believe, uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for the answers. Anish also sent uh, greetings as well. So any other questions from the audience? Please, we would like to invite more questions and discussion to topics i would uh, let me ask questions first uh, dr erwin and dr ian so before the pandemics i think uh, telepharmacy was already introduced and implemented however it was that time was kind of old or strange to receive distance services such as uh, telepharmacy or teleconsultations however the pandemics has changed everything flipped down So including in our experience, the geriatric and also the elderly population who is supposed to be held illiterate or like technological illiterate, they also are quite familiar with the use of applications and also distance services like telepharmacy. I was wondering about the patient population in your uh, experience who is uh, mostly or often access the telepharmacy services. Is it uh, not in all age population or there is a particular population who, was, who are using the telepharmacy services? Please, uh, perhaps. I think from my experience, mostly with uh, a younger age, no? um, maybe around 20 to 40 years old that uh, usually use. No? Uh, but for a geriatric patient, uh, that will be mostly guided <laughs> mostly guided by young generation because uh, they may have a problem in terms of you know literacy in terms of using the platform uh, so even also uh, old doctors may have also difficulty <laughs> to talk with their patient because uh, uh, some of it is not that uh, they're very convenient to use uh, with the platform they rather go face to face but uh, it's already been obsolete right now to have Uh, only with a face to face sometimes it will be hybrid format no if you don't want to go to the medical doctor you just want to sit at your houses and then talk with the doctor then you can do it no uh, you can be flexible in that manner but mostly uh, of the patient are usually age of 20 to 40 years old some of them are 60 years old but they are usually guided uh, but because of accessibility now um, in the in the local village uh, village uh, pharmacy or even also in the rural health no? uh, clinics and pharmacy, they can even access, no? they just kind of go there and also, uh, but uh, of course the doctors in the private or even in the government, uh, they still actually adopting tele, uh, telemedicine and telepharmacy still. Is it similar in your experience, Ian? Uh, in my current experience, uh, we've recently we've been pushing for more telepharmacy customers in the pharmacy that I'm currently affiliated with. Uh, uh, like usual, uh, it's really spread out. It's usually from in between, as what Doc Irwin had said, between 20 to 40s. Uh, usually, uh, mine is about 20 to 50s. However, um, as I also the 
our geriatrics are also guided. But there are some geriatric patients that they really come to the pharmacy and then they really ask us. And then uh, we we try to sell it to them na, Mom, we have our telepharmacy services. You can just contact us through Messenger, through Viber, through WhatsApp, or uh, through any contacting services. We also have our contact numbers for questions related. You can call us at any time. However, uh, there is something called, uh, there is the the sense of routine of our geriatric patients that they would prefer they want to go to the pharmacy. They want to really talk to you and then you can give them advice. And then afterwards, the we try to push them towards telepharmacy so that they won't have to go out of their house so that they can be kept safe. However, there are some times that our <clears throat> we have also patients that are more akin to just using I'm sorry. Uh using uh delivery services. We have here in the Philippines we have Grab and Food Panda. They also serve as deliveries for over-the-counter medications and some prescription medications provided that the patients can show that they can purchase those with their prescriptions. They usually send it to us and then we can see a copy. So we, in that case, since we cannot really provide telepharmacy directly in terms of voice or through video conferencing, we actually leave paper pamphlets that provide instructions so that we are we are still doing our jobs that we're still providing information to our patients even though they are they are getting third party uh third party delivery applications so we still try to provide information as much as we can even though we have limited areas of delivery hi thank you very much so uh, this is quite important to our audience as well so when you are delivering the telepharmacy services I mean, most of the our assumption will be like we are talking directly to the patient either over the phone or like this Zoom call meetings, etc. However, there are plenty of ways to do that, including like in the Dr. Ian's uh, experience, sending pamphlet instructions to the uh, customers directly through uh, what we call now it's online delivery systems. So yeah, uh, it's, it's quite possible as well. So um, I was just wondering about the duration of talk if you are if you are doing it over the phone or if you are doing it like video call etc uh, how many minutes how much how how, how long uh, you do you usually uh, provide the services to the patients because it is quite it is quite important as well because one of the reluctance re, uh, one of the reluctance of pharmacists doing this one in our survey in our study was the doing telepharmacy actually add more job and also more time for the pharmacist, particularly if they already work in place. So whenever you, for example, if you're already work in place for about eight hours, and then you have to do another uh, extra for uh, telepharmacy services, then it's quite a burden sum in, in, in some ways. So I was just wondering uh, how long do you think the duration, I mean, in your experience, the duration was? Typically, yeah. I think typically, commonly. I mean, please. Please, uh, I, you know, to uh, try uh, uh, Okay, so um, in my experience, we we do not do telehealth, uh, we do not do telepharmacy consultations during peak hours. In our community pharmacy, our peak hours at about 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And we also have peak hours during 11 a.m. to 2 PM. During those times, we try to avoid answering telepharmacy telepharmacy services. We usually we usually set times with our patients that you can contact because our pharmacy is open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we usually tell our patients that if you want to go for telepharmacy services, if you want to contact us, it would be very nice if you would contact us during this time. And if if you contact us during peak hours, please expect that we will not respond on time the moment you ask the question. But we will respond as soon as we can. Usually, when we do con uh, video conferencing or through the phone, an average time, an average handling time of about 15 to 25 minutes per person or per patient. We try to we try to lower it. However, uh 
sometimes pa- pa- patients get chatty. <laughs> they try to talk about their lives. They try to talk about the latest, the latest happening. So we try we, as much as we want to try to loop it back to the topic at hand. We get lost sometimes, and also we as pharmacists also want to want to know more about their lives because this is still part of the establishment of the therapeutic relationship. We want to make it seem that our patients are also important to us, and we want them to feel comfortable sharing to us important uh, snippets of their lives. So, usually a handling time of fifteen to twenty five minutes, but we usually handle it during off peak hours. So that is on our end. So I, I assume it's going to be similar in Dr. experience. Yes, um, actually, um, that is why um, in the in the community or even in the hospital setting, you need to have a forms, no, so that you'll be able to concentrate and focus uh, on what will be your objective, no, when you do medication review or patient counseling. Then, uh, so all of these things must be provided already. You just need to take an all. All and uh, what to be the what to be the the particular focus or what what do they want no in terms of this uh, it's like actually what we have learned in the drug information uh, counseling or drug uh, drug counseling that we have or even drug information services it's actually similar it's quite very similar the only difference is that we'll be able to deliver also products no. And not only services not to our client to our patient. So it depends from person to person. There are there are really patient to direct to the point, and sometimes you need to really direct them to the point because uh, yes, uh, Doctor Ayan is very very you know, very expert in it. That really there's a lot of patient who are very chatty, and you need really to direct them to the point because also. Ideally, you need only to have five minutes for them of interaction, because of course, uh, economically, if you want to compute it per individual, then of course, uh, you know the telepharmacy need to also exert profit aside from the services that they be able to provide. No? So you need you need to have in place with the system, you need to have forms, you need to have um, you know directions of your conversation. So it's like that. No? So your personnel need to also to be trained. You need to be, uh, you need to be equipped also uh, because sometimes uh, showing empathy, no, is also difficult. No, when it is online or sometimes uh, your conversation gets to be more intense. No, so uh, you need to remember that you also have other people. So it depends. Sometimes we need to schedule them. Like for example, this. This particular hour, uh, you have an appointment with this patient. No? So um, in a day, you can actually schedule maybe perhaps uh, depending on the availability. That's why in the U.S. in European countries, they are a lot of uh, telepharmacy experts. No? That's the trending now no? uh, because uh, they want to have a focus in terms of only for telehealth, for this kind of services. That they be able to provide. So some of the big chain drug store, uh, they actually acquired third party services you know, for this telecommunication services, only providing with this kind of service. Because sometimes in the community setting or in the hospital setting, it's a little bit really costly for manpower, you now for the busy schedule of the pharmacist, and of course, um, you know, sometimes uh, patients are very demanding in terms of the time. So it's quite difficult. You know? If you have multitasking while you're doing your dispensing, you have also doing telepharmacy. So um, it's quite really very difficult. Yeah. Yes, quite agree with the uh, last statement because it's also uh, quite challenging, particularly for most community pharmacy. I'm not, perhaps the hospital pharmacy, they have more resources, but about but with respect to community pharmacy, it's going to be challenging, particularly if they only have one or two pharmacies on site. And it's going to be tricky to do telepharmacy. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayan and also Dr. Erwin. So uh, audience, ladies and gentlemen, as you hear in background, my children's already singing around. <laughs> so uh, it's approaching the end of the lecture today. Uh, so thank you very much again to Dr. Erwin, Professor Dr. Erwin Fowler and also Dr. Ian Ace. 
for your particular contribution to Universitas Erlangga and also to the relationship between UNER and also SPC College uh, Philippines, particularly with respect to the college, uh, to the course today, the lecture today. And then uh, we will meet again with Dr. Erwin and Dr. Ayan, uh, I think within the next two weeks in our joint class program. And to all audience, thank you very much uh, for attending this session and see you again. Bye-bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. See thank you. you very much.